So around the world, you have these micro-regions when people are leaving unreasonably long and successful lives. There's Okinawa in Japan, Sardinia in Italy, and Loma Linda right here in California. In Okinawa, you see one-sixth the rate of cardiovascular disease that's seen in the U.S. And in Sardinia, there are seven times the rate of centenarians. So what gives these people so many more years of precious, healthy life? Sure, there's a diet and there's good genes, but there's something else, too, and that's social ties. Research on these populations show that they have a higher number of daily social interactions. They communicate with each other. They collaborate when it comes to their health. And they're just one in a body of emerging evidence that shows how social ties are really influencing our health. A longitudinal cardiovascular study done over the past few decades has shown that if a person that you know has become obese, the probability that you become obese also increases by 57%. Sure, we are what we eat, but we're also the company we keep. And not long ago, communities often came together and collaborated when it came to caring for the sick and the elderly. But today, that doesn't happen. And it's not for bad reasons. There's privacy, there's insurance reimbursement structures, and there's lawsuits. But as a result, living with a chronic disease is an incredibly lonely experience, punctuated by a few visits to see a health professional. And many chronic disease patients report feeling lonely, um, feeling debilitated, and as a result, you get adverse health outcomes and added mental health issues. But it's not lost on the healthcare community that social ties can deliver better health outcomes. And recently, they've started to collaborate and think about how this can be shaped into a tool, a clinical tool, just like a drug and just like a procedure, in order to deliver better health care. But what does that look like? And does a doctor prescribe it? And come on, is an insurance company going to pay me to have some more friends? The answer to all of these questions is surprisingly yes. Shared medical visits are a concept being piloted in health centers across America. In a shared medical visit, you have a doctor, a nurse, and maybe a pharmacist all meet together at the same time with eight to 10 patients. Now, a typical primary care visit lasts about 10 minutes. But in a shared medical visit, and here's a photograph of one right here, you get over 90 minutes of collective time to learn from these health professionals, to brainstorm, to problem solve, to build a community of supporters. And with these people, you often informally continue to meet up with them after. If you boil it down, a shared medical visit is just facilitating a meaningful social, social interaction in the name of health. And this isn't just some kumbaya sort of feel-good thing. Research is actually showing that this is measurably improving health outcomes. So I want to look at it from the lens of diabetes. Now, for any diabetic patient, the goal of a health intervention is to reduce your blood sugar level, and that's measured by a test known as hemoglobin A1c. A healthy person has an A1c level of about, of about four, a diabetic has an A1c level of six, and someone with an episode of uncontrolled diabetes has something that's over eight. Now, insulin, which is your gold standard for diabetes management, reduces your blood sugar levels by about two points. And an oral anti-diabetic medication has the possibility of reducing it by one point. And a shared medical visit, which promotes better blood sugar management through a, through a better lifestyle, through diet and through exercise, is also shown to reduce blood sugar levels by one point in randomized clinical trials. And not only are these effective, but they're also something that people want. For the past year, I've collaborated with a team of health professionals to build software that enables clinics to deliver shared medical visits in a compliant and legal way. And in that time, I've seen two complete strangers come together and brainstorm a strategy to remember to take insulin on a travel-heavy schedule. I've also seen an elderly asthma patient be inspired to start taking walks because of a young asthma patient who still plays basketball every single day. And I've also seen doctors and nurses for the first time in a crazy and jam-packed day have the opportunity to sit down and offer thoughtful and personalized feedback to a patient. 
Patients participating in shared medical visits report higher levels of patient satisfaction and improved quality of life. And Medicare and Medicaid are listening too. Recently, Medicare and a few private insurance companies have offered the ability to re get reimbursed for shared medical visits. So today, we have a medical system that's largely being overburdened. If you look in America today, by 2030, we're going to have a shortage of about 45,000 primary care physicians. And at the same time, millions of more people are going to be diagnosed with a chronic disease. And the way that our health system is managing that today is by allowing you to have a shorter amount of time with your healthcare professional. And so what that means is that visits are short and follow-up is either automated or it's done on the phone. And when you do have time with the doctor, it's entirely focused on your pills and on your medication. So when we first find out that we have a chronic disease and we think about what we're going to do for the rest of our life to manage it, we turn to the internet, we turn to blogs, we maybe turn to Dr. Oz, but we don't turn to a health professional who has knowledge of our personal histories. And we don't create a community of accountability that asks us to stay committed to a diet or an exercise regimen or supports us. And as a result, you have what we see in America today, where preventable diseases are killing more people than infectious diseases. You start with a sickness that's manageable or, or maybe even preventable, and eventually it just spirals out of control into something that's debilitating, that's costly, that's even deadly. About a year ago, the oldest living person in the world passed away after 117 years and 27 days of life. She was from, you might be able to guess it, Okinawa in Japan. And on her 117th birthday, she was asked to comment on her life. She said, it's rather short. And in reflecting on a life that was filled with daily social engagements, it was pretty apparent that those daily social engagements were the reason that she lived for so long. But they were also the reason to live for so long. Thank you.